on a new tour bus full of old guitars. <laughs> to aviation safety I've always subscribed to the philosophy that the only dumb question is the one you didn't get an answer to or the one you didn't bother to ask so if you talk to your friends about paragliding inevitably a couple questions come up how high can you go how fast can you go those are usually questions from outside of the community that we all know really don't matter but recently I've been haunted by a question I keep seeing What's the shortest distance I can take off in a paramotor from? And you know what? That's a good question. But the real insidious problem with the question is that it indicates somebody's trying to fit paramotor flying into too small of a space and they know it. And there's either a tree line, which is problematic because it causes turbulence or power lines so the better question would be what's the minimum distance it takes me to get airborne and accelerate to a maneuvering speed but the question itself got me to thinking about performance parameters concerning paragliding that do matter although it's very difficult to quantify paramotor performance because of the human factors the uh, physical performance factors, um, there are certainly some things that are at least worth considering from a safety standpoint. All right, so let's say that you and I build an airplane, an experimental home build. We build it in the garage. How do we determine what the performance capability of that airplane is? Well, one thing at a time, we test the airplane and record the data, and that becomes our performance handbook. Our rate of climb, our rate of descent, all of that kind of stuff. Our takeoff distances. And our landing distances in particular are very, very important numbers because we're gonna wanna know if we load that airplane up to gross weight how much runway it takes us to get airborne. If we come into a short strip, we go over to our buddy's house, he's got a grass runway, how much runway does it take to get that thing landed and stopped? And all that data comes from our testing that we do during our 40-hour fly-off period as soon after the FAA gives us the blessing to go fly our experimental home build. Alright, so how did Cessna and Piper and Maul and all of those other certified aircraft manufacturers do it? Well, they pretty much did the same thing, test data. The only difference was they used test pilots that were highly skilled and trained in the techniques that were repeatable. So let's say you buy a 1975 Cessna 172, are you going to bet your life on those numbers? Don't forget, now those numbers were created by test pilots that had training. The aircraft was brand new out of the factory. The paint was brand new, and it weighed what the specification said it weighed. It didn't acquire gum wrappers and barf bags and all the seat back pockets, all of the things that make an airplane progressively heavier throughout its ownership, several owners installing and removing avionics. And I know weight and balances can be updated, but the point of it is, is that airplane was tested when it was new, and it ain't new anymore. So the typical general aviation axiom is, if you really want to stack the cards in your favor of safety, you're going to want to add an arbitrary percentage to those factory numbers that were derived when that aircraft was manufactured. They just don't perform all the time as well as they did when they were brand new. So how do the airlines and the transport category airplanes do it? You know, those great big military airplanes. Speaking of which, one mistakenly landed at Peter O'Knight Airport back in 2012. 
it was a media circus and all oh, the poor Air Force idiots that did it but the engineers that came out engineers ah not test pilots engineers big difference the engineers that came out they kept taking a weight off of that airplane until they got it to the point where they knew it would fly because they do performance differently than we do in paragliders single engine airplanes and light aviation so I say engineers because it the transport category airport everything is determined by engineers nothing is left a chance from the sheer strength of the telephone poles in case you fly into one of them to the load-bearing capacity of the tarmac every single thing at an airport is engineered if you can't find a job as an engineer at a civil airport you're probably otherwise unemployable they're not the grip the greatest jobs but there's always engineering work to be done around airports So back to that very unfortunate Peter O'Knight story. How did they figure if they could make it or not? Well, what they did was, it's done differently. It's done with weight, right? So the test pilots figure out distances. They figure out feet and inches. The engineers figure out weight. And what they did in that situation was they knew the runway length, it was very short. And they said, how much weight do we have to take off of this airplane to be able to get the thing airborne and have runway remaining and have a balanced field length and all of those other requirements. They may have had to get some exemptions because I know that was a tremendous colossal botched landing and approach. Same thing at the airline. The test data has validated the data points on the charts. Everything is done by weight. How much weight can we land on this runway with and stop? How much weight can we take off with and carry out of here? If we weigh a certain amount, what's our maximum service ceiling? If we weigh a certain amount and we lose an engine, what are our single engine climb parameters? Well, you might think none of that has to do with the paraglider story, but I'm going to tell you that it does. So back to the guy in the yard with the paraglider trying to clear the tree line or the power lines. Huh. All right, so here's the deal. Lately, I've been reading the same guy's question over and over again. He wants to take off in a real short LZ, and he wants to know if he can calculate his takeoff distance with a parrot motor. Nope, because there's a it's lot tough. of variables. It's tough. You've got wind, you've got uh, humidity, density altitude. What about pilot body angle? Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. It's... Rotor off the tree. I mean, yeah. just way the too many. And, and if he's doing it to clear a tree line, I wouldn't bet my life on the calculations of this for sure. He's got mechanical turbulence. If he's doing it to clear power lines, he doesn't have mechanical turbulence, but he's got a uh, real... Yeah. You know what you do? You plan on circling. Just give yourself enough room to circle and get altitude. Don't plan on trying to go straight up. So the trick isn't how much altitude you can get. It's how long it takes you from takeoff to get to trim speed where you have full maneuverability. Right, exactly, right. exactly. You need full maneuverability. And you got to have enough room to be able to turn around with your skill level and spiral up. I'm going to watch Philip take off here. So, transport category airplane performance, the one where we measure things in pounds, they have everything figured out to the minimum poundage. So, something as simple as a missing fairing. You can go without it, and there's a, there's a pound correction. for how much more weight you can't take because of the additional drag that that missing fairing causes. If there's a quarter inch of snow on the runway, there's a weight penalty because the snow affects both your takeoff roll and your ability to stop, both of which are required to be in some sort of a parameter of safety to ensure that the traveling public stays safe. Well, you're in charge of the safety when you're flying your paramotor. Nobody else. I almost went out and tried to clip into my wing without my motor on. I think I have become the bird. 
there are just too many variables in human performance to be able to accurately predict distances for paraglider performance. So one sidestep, one gopher hole, one little additional application of brake earlier in the takeoff versus later in the takeoff where it's less of a factor on your performance. All of these things can extremely increase your takeoff distance. The need to sort out a problem, picking at lines, motor spool up time, body angle, the amount of lean back, the wind. For crying out loud, if you're planning a takeoff with no wind, worst case scenario, no wind, but all of a sudden you get a two mile an hour tailwind that you weren't planning on, well now you, you may have just, think about it in terms of percentage, a two mile an hour tailwind when you only need to be going 12 miles an hour is a 20% increase, well 18% increase in your total takeoff distance required. There's just really no way to quantify it and hang your hat on it safely. So make good decisions. Let's go. So by the way, the only stupid question is the one that you didn't ask. I really resent the attitude that a particular pilot is a fool because he asked that question or because he didn't know. Let's get over ourselves and help everybody be as safe as we can. I don't care if you're an instructor selling training or if you're a guy that's been doing this forever or you're a guy that's new at it. You see somebody doing something unsafe and you can help them out, by all means, geez, offer your help. Instead of telling them they need to buy your training. There's plenty of people out there still buying training. Clear prop. So next time I want to talk about some general guidelines with performance in mind rather than specific measurable performance criteria. And I think it'll translate to helping everybody at least be aware of some concepts that will let you fly safer.